Okay, welcome to day two. We're going to be covering sample uh, proportions and difference in proportions today. So let's talk about Reese's Pieces. Everyone's maybe not favorite candy, but everyone knows what they are. So our big question is, if we take a sample of Reese's Pieces, what proportion of the candies will be orange? So let's say we have a large bag, like this kind of cell, you know, for a party with a thousand pieces. The manufacturer says that exactly 40% of the candies are orange. If we take a sample of 50 pieces, how many will be orange? Well, first question is, what is what type of probability distribution are we dealing with? Well, this is going to be a binomial distribution. And remember, we have to meet bins to be binomial. So is it binary? There's success or failure. Yes, it's either orange or it's not orange. It has to be independent. But if we don't do replacement, we can get around this independent uh, criteria if our sample size is less than 10% of the population. And certainly 50 is less than 10% of 1,000. So we've met the 10% rule. So we're OK on independence. N is that we have to have a set number of trials, which is 50. And S is we have to have the same probability every trial, which is 0.4. So that's all good. And so we take a sample of 50 Reese's pieces, and we're going to use this applet. So if you are doing this on your own, the applet can be found at tinyurl.com, sorry, it's messy there, slash LHNBQK4. And what we're going to do is put in the, the information. What is the probability? What is our sample size? And tell it to pick a sample. So when I did that, I got 26 out of the 50 pieces were orange. And then I did it again. I got 20. Again, I got 14, 18, and 22. And then I created a dot plot if I had done it 50 times. So here are all the different ones that I got. And remember, each dot represents a sample of 50 Reese's pieces and the number of orange dot or orange dots, orange candies within that sample of 50 Reese's. So for instance, this one right here with 22 represents a sample of 50 Reese's pieces with 22 orange ones within it. Calculate the mean and standard deviation. Well, mean, because it's a binomial distribution, we find by n times p, so 50 times 0.4. Our standard deviation, we find by n times p times 1 minus p, which gives us 3.46. What is the approximate shape and sketch it? Well, it's approximately normal. And we can say that because we meet the large counts criteria. And make sure we know that we're saying this because we meet the large counts, that n times p is greater than, so n times p is 20, which is greater than 10, and n times 1 minus p is 30, which is also greater than 10. So here's what the shape would look like. And at the center is 20. And this represents the number of orange candies in a sample of 50 Reese's Pieces. OK, let's continue on here. And on the next one, this is where we get into our proportions. So we're looking to see the proportion of those candies that are orange. So we're going to take those five values we got from our applet. And to get the proportion, I'm dividing each one by 50. So here are the values I get. And if you do this yourself, feel free to use your own values. This is the same sampling distribution that I had on the front with just the number of orange candies. Here is the proportion of orange candies. And notice the title. It's a sampling distribution of P hat. So I'm looking at the proportion of orange candies. Each dot here represents one sample of 50 Reese's Pieces and the proportion of orange candies in it. Not the number, but the proportion. Find the new mean and standard deviation. OK. Well, to find our mean, we're going to take n times p, but we need to divide by n because we want a proportion. So notice the n's cancel out, leaving just a p. So my mean is going to be the proportion from the population. And that's what I have right here. Uh, the standard deviation of my proportion, that's what p hat is, remember, the proportion of your sample. I'm going to take my standard deviation and divide it by 50. So 
I get 0 0.0692. Now notice the math that come, gives us this. Originally, our standard deviation was n times p times 1 minus uh, p. Well, I needed to divide by n, and n would be outside the square root symbol. But if I want to put it under the square root symbol, that's the same as n squared square rooted. The n's cancel, so this n and one of the squares, so I'm left with p times 1 minus p divided by n. This is how I'm going to find the standard deviation for a sampling distribution of proportions. The approximate shape, again, check for large counts so that we can say that it's normal. n times p is greater than 10 and n times 1 minus p was greater than 10. So this is what my shape would look like, and it's approximately normal. We want to know what is the probability that a sample proportion, so if I did a random sample of 50 candies, what is the, what is the probability that a proportion, uh, what is the probability that my sample of 50 Reese's Pieces will have a proportion of 50% or greater of orange candies? So again, I'm looking at my normal distribution. 0.4 is the mean that I'm using, 0 0.0692. Here's what it looks like. And again, this represents the proportion, proportion of orange candies. Oops, candies. Z score is the proportion I'm interested in minus the proportion that is from the population divided by standard deviation, which is 1.45. And of course, I, when I go to the table, I know I'm going to have to subtract that value from 1 because I want what's greater than. So 1 minus 0 0.9265 gives me 0 0.0735. So there is a 0 0.0735 probability that if I take a random sample of 50 Reese's Pieces, they will have 50% or more orange candies within it. And again, this is how I found my z-score. It's p hat minus p, the true mean, Standard deviation is p times 1 minus p over n square rooted. And let's look at our learning targets for this one. And feel free to pause this, of course, as you're trying to write this down. Learning target 1, the mean and standard deviation for a proportion sam uh, sampling distribution of proportions. The mean of a sampling distribution is the same as the proportion from your population. The standard deviation of our sampling distribution is found by p times 1 minus p divided by n, all of that square rooted, as long as our 10% condition is met. So remember, we have to meet that 10%, that our sample size is less than 10% of the population for us to be able to use these. Learning target two, we can say that it's approximately normal if the large counts condition is met. So if n times p and n times 1 minus p are both greater than or equal to 10, then we can say that our distribution is approximately normal. And if we can say it's approximately normal, then our z-score is calculated by p hat minus p divided by the square root of p times 1 minus p divided by n, and all of that was under the square root symbol. So let's do the check for understanding. Again, pause the video while you go through and do this yourselves, or as much as you can, and then come back to see where you needed clarification. I hit pause. Okay, here we go. Okay, so we're talking about 8% of adults have never had a cavity. If we do a simple random sample of 1,000, we want to calculate p hat. 8% represents P, because that's from all adults. 8% have no cavity, so that represents P. 1,000 is N, the sample size. So identify the mean of the sampling distribution. Well, we know that the mean of our sampling distribution is the same as the proportion from the population, so that's P. So that's 0 0.08. Calculate and interpret the standard deviation. Again, for a... Standard deviation for p hat is found by p times 1 minus p divided by n, all of that square rooted, so 0 0.8 times 0 0.92 divided by 1,000, we get 0 
And the way we interpret that, and again, you want to always be able to interpret this, is that the sample proportion of adults that have never had a cavity typically varies by 0 0.009 from the true proportion of 0 0.08. Notice I did not say from the mean, but from the true proportion of 0 0.08. And again, we had to make sure we met the 10% condition. So 1,000 times 8%, um, and we're going to do that right here, is 80. 1,000 times 1 minus P is 920. Both of those are clearly greater than 10, so we can say it's approximately normal. And if it's approximately normal, now we can use our normal Z calculations. So what, find the probability that a random sample of 1,000 adults will give a result within two percentage points of the true uh, value. So if the true value is 8%, what is the proportion from 6% to 10%? Because 6% is 2% lower, 10% is 2% higher than 8. So again, I'm going to use my formula for Z, P hat minus P, divided by my standard deviation. So 0 0.06 minus 0 0.08, I'm calculating on the lower end first. And I get a, negative, a Z score of negative 2.22 which gives me a proportion of 0 0.0132 from the table. Well, if I, because this is symmetrical in a normal distribution, I know that if I did 0 0.10 minus 0 0.08, I'll have the same z-score, but just the opposite sign. So it's going to be positive. So the pro probability for a z-score of 2.22 is 9, 0.9868. Subtract these, and we get 0.9736 is the probability that a random sample will fall within 2% 2 of 8%. And we could do this on the calculator, and I'm just starting to introduce this very slowly to you, but on a test, you can do normal CDF. You have to enter four pieces of information. Your lower bound, so the lower limit is 0 0.06, the upper bound is 0 0.10, the p-value is 0 0.08, and the standard deviation is 0 0.009. If you were to write this on your test, you have to list what each value represents. So again, we're going to try and get you to always write this out. And finally, if the sample size were 9,000 instead of 1,000, how would that affect it? Well, so the standard deviation would still be 0 0.08 times 0.92, but divided by 9,000 instead of 1,000. And the value we got was 0 0.003. Well, the only difference is I've multiplied the denominator by 9. So if I were to take the square root of that, of 1 over 9, I get 1 third. So my new standard deviation it decreases to 1 third of the value of the original standard deviation. The mean would stay the same. OK, and let's stop there. Feel free to see me if you have questions or check your textbook, and we'll go on to the next video.